If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Proverbs 21.21. Should be an easy one for you to remember, and this is one I want you to remember. Um, I was talking to Lance about you know, ways to take these, because, like I said, Proverbs isn't one of those books that you can just kind of pick up and preach through an entire chapter. Uh, some of them you can, uh, but after about chapter 10 on, uh, it gets really hard to preach on a specific chapter of Proverbs because it's so uh, pretty much random as to how they're collected. And that's okay. So I was talking with Lance how he wanted to do it. And he said, well, sometimes I'll do it like by theme, like he did last week with wealth and riches. Um, and he said, other times I'm just going to pull out one or two from, <coughs> excuse me, one or two Proverbs that... I think are really meaningful and just kind of preach on those. So, um, as I was looking through this week, um, I came across one of my favorite Proverbs, Proverbs 21, 21. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, the pursuit. What are you pursuing? What are you pursuing? Uh, if I were, and that answer to that question varies depending on where you are in your life. Um, if I were speaking to... Um, you know, a group in their teens, what are you pursuing? Well, especially teenage guys, what are you pursuing? I'm pursuing girls. Teenage girls, what are you pursuing? I'm pursuing a high ACT score so I can get to this college, right? That's how it pretty much works. Um, if I were speaking to a group of uh, 20-somethings, kind of fresh out of college, what are you pursuing? Well, I'm pursuing that job. I'm pursuing marriage. I'm pursuing home ownership. I'm pursuing, you know, essentially the American dream. Um, get on up into your 40s, 50s. What are you pursuing? Well, I'm pursuing a fully funded 401k. I'm pursuing that job promotion. I'm pursuing yeah, a, a better, bigger house, nicer cars. What are you pursuing? Even if you're retired, you're still pursuing something. Everyone is chasing after something. Everyone has their eyes fixed on something that they're chasing after. What are you pursuing? It's really easy, um, especially this time of year, to figure out what people are chasing after. Uh, Lance kind of mentioned it a little bit this morning, but I think it's absolutely ridiculous that stores are opening earlier and earlier on into Thanksgiving. Um, Black Friday is bad enough. I, I, I can honestly say I have never gone Black Friday shopping, like early morning Black Friday shopping. If you have, that's okay. I'm not judging you. I just think you're nuts. No. No, it's okay. My wife has done that with my mother-in-law a couple of times. Get up at like 5 in the morning to be at Walmart by 6. I'm like, why? So you can get a, a toaster for 30% off. Seriously? But now it's getting earlier and earlier. On into Thanksgiving Day. But I mean, it really shouldn't surprise us, should it? I mean, stores are out to make money. I mean, that's their goal. And if people will shop, there's money to be made. What are you pursuing? I've seen pictures on Facebook of some of my uh, friends from around the country driving by a Best Buy where there's already people camped out in front of Best Buy. It's like, it's a week early. More than a week early. Like, a week and a half early. No. Tents pitched in the sidewalk in front of Best Buy. Like, what are you thinking? What are you pursuing? I've seen another little, uh, little picture going around uh, Facebook uh, that says something to the effect of, only in America would you have people trample each other to death for a good deal over a TV the day after they're thankful for what they already have. This time of year is just rampant with consumerism. If you're watching the TV, it's all about what the latest sales are. I mean, even more so than other times of the year. What are you pursuing? What are you pursuing? Well. Our founding fathers had something to say about pursuit and what they thought Americans were trying to pursue. 
Uh, all the way back to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Thomas Jefferson penned these words uh, to the uh, King of England declaring our independence. And this is uh, within the first section of it. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. We're good so far. All right, I like this. And that they are endowed by their creator. Uh, creator, big C, creator. All right, we're good. With certain unalienable rights. That among these are life. I believe everybody has the right to life. Amen. That's why I'm not pro-choice. <laughs> I'm pro-life. Everybody has the right to life and to liberty, which is kind of ironic because at the time they owned slaves. So everybody has the right to liberty. Well, I believe that. Maybe more so than they did even back then. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. What are you pursuing? Americans are pursuing happiness. We think latest, greatest, biggest, best, shiniest is going to make us happy. So we pursue happiness. And if happiness means that I need a bigger TV, so be it. I'll camp out in front of Best Buy a week and a half early to get a good sale on a big TV. If happiness means that I'm going to be spending every night at the bar while my wife takes care of the, the kids that after a horrible day, then so be it. I'm pursuing my happiness. Pursuit of happiness. This is what a nation becomes when we take the pursuit of happiness a little bit too far. In fact, there was a movie made not too long ago called The Pursuit of Happiness. And I love it. It's intentionally misspelled happy with a Y. Happiness. Um, from some graffiti outside of the little kid's daycare. Uh, but in this movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, with Will Smith and his son, that's uh, his son, Jaden Smith. Amazing movie. If you haven't seen it, I, I really recommend it. It's a great movie. Uh, Will Smith plays the character Chris Gardner, based on real life. And in the movie, he has this quote, sort of an inner monologue of himself. He says, It was right then I started thinking about Thomas Jefferson on the Declaration of Independence, and the part about our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I remember thinking, how did he know to put that pursuit part in there? That maybe happiness is something we can only pursue, and maybe we can never actually have it, no matter what. How did he know that? The pursuit of happiness. We can never actually have that. Because all of us have had times in our lives where we thought, oh, if I only had this, I would be happy. And then we get that, whatever it is, and we realize we're still not happy. Eventually it breaks, eventually it stops working, eventually it gives out on us. It, and it really resonated with, and with me what uh, one of the speakers at a youth gathering that we went to not too long ago um, said about this. He said, you must realize that everything you own, everything you currently have in your possession, everything will eventually end up in a landfill. Everything. Everything eventually gets broken. Everything eventually gets stolen. Everything eventually rusts and breaks down, which I think Jesus had a lot of insight into that when he said, don't lay up the treasures for yourself on earth, where everything's just going to end up in a garbage heap one day, no matter how precious it is to you. It reminds me of the movie Citizen Kane. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Citizen Kane, the old black and white, or some little dude? Um, really slow movie. <laughs> like, we were watching it and we were like, why is this like one of the, hailed as one of the best American movies? But you got to hang on till the end. And if you haven't seen it, spoilers. Too bad. <laughs> it's a really old movie. You should have by now. Uh, but at the very beginning of it, it shows him on his deathbed. And his last words that this citizen came, this wealthy you know, billionaire, investor, banker, etc., etc. The last words he uttered on his deathbed were the words, was the word rosebud. And then the whole movie, you're, you're wondering, what is Rosebud? What, is, what does that mean? I'm trying to figure it out. And so you get to the, the very end, and you see them, the men going through his home and sorting through his goods after he's died, and they throw a sled into the furnace. And the sled is named Rosebud. The thing he wanted 
after gaining pretty much the whole world, was at his fingertips, after gaining everything he ever wanted, the one thing he wanted was the one thing he could never get back, and that was the precious memories from his childhood, a simpler time, a better time, a time when he was actually happy. Maybe happiness is something we can never actually have. Ecclesiastes speaks along those lines. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 4. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure and find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine, embracing folly. My mind was still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during their few days of their lives. And he reaches this conclusion in Ecclesiastes 2, 10 and 11. I deny myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and all I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. A chasing after the wind is how he describes this pursuit of happiness. Another way of thinking of it is chasing after the wind or chasing rainbows. You've got this old tale about you know chasing after the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Well, I don't know about you, but you know, you're driving down the interstate after a big thunderstorm has just blown through, and you see this gigantic rainbow that seems right just ahead of you. But the closer you get to it, the further away it gets. It's just an illusion. It looks so real, so tangible. It's like you can just reach out and touch it. But all it is is refracted light. It's an illusion. There's nothing to it. There's no pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, and there's no pleasure, ultimate pleasure, in pursuing happiness. Proverbs 21, 21. If you're one that you know highlights or underlines or whatever in your Bible, I would say this is one worth marking. Proverbs 21, 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. Whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. Those are words to live by. Because here in America, I think we've got it the other way around. Here in America, especially, and you know, it's lots of other places too, and the church is not immune from this either. But so many times we get caught up in pursuing the second part of this. We get caught up in pursuing life and prosperity and honor. Those are the things that we seek after. We pursue prosperity. We pursue honor. We do the things that we think are going to enhance our life and are going to bring happiness. And we think that by pursuing those things, we're going to find love and righteousness. But we've got it backwards, folks. He says, whoever pursues righteousness and love, above all, above all, your pursuit should be of righteousness and love. And when you do that, when you seek with all your heart righteousness and love, then all these other things will be taken care of. Life, prosperity, and honor. That doesn't work in the real world, does it? Well, just ask Joseph. Joseph. I love the story of Joseph. Huge, long section of Joseph never has a recorded sin against him. He's put through temptation after temptation, trial after trial, but his pursuit is for righteousness and love. Because righteousness and love in, Proverbs, in this proverb, Proverbs 21, 21, righteousness and love are not things. They're not things you chase after. They are a person that you chase after. God, Jesus, the embodiment of righteousness and love. Righteousness and love is a person. 
When you seek after the person of God, the person of Christ, these are the things you find. Joseph had his eyes set on God, not on the things around him. He didn't have his eyes set on the, on the well. He had his eyes set on being pleasing to God. He didn't have his eyes set on the jail he found himself in after being set up and framed. He didn't, you know, his focus wasn't on the bars and how do I get out of here. His focus was on God. How do I be the best servant of God that I can? Even when things started to turn around for him and he was promoted to Pharaoh's court, his focus and his pursuit was not on self-promotion and earthly gain. He wasn't caught up in all the gold and the splendor of the Egyptian palace around him. His focus, his pursuit was God. He pursued righteousness and love, and he found life, prosperity, and honor. What about David? You can ask David about that. Does this work in real life? Yes. Uh, flip with me, if you would, over to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. In 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14, we have the prophet Samuel talking to King Saul. King Saul took his eyes off of God. He stopped pursuing righteousness and love and started pursuing the things, the prosperity, the honor. He started seeking those for himself, and he took his eyes off God. And this is the consequence. Samuel talking to Saul, You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had... You would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of the people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Here David is called a man after God's own heart. When we read through the Psalms, we read through the entire life of King David from the time he's a shepherd boy to the time he's on his deathbed as king over Israel. His pursuit, his aim, his focus was on God. He was pursuing righteousness and love. And when he wasn't, when he took his eyes off of that pursuit for, for a moment, that's when he found his whole life erupting into chaos. <coughs> and he had to fix his focus back on God and pursue first things first. He was a man after God's own heart. Alright, what about Solomon? Solomon, King Solomon, you're the wisest guy in the world. And you, you know, he may have even written this proverb. Does this actually work in real life? Well, 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Verses 5 through 14. I love this story. If God were to show up to you one night and ask you, what do you want from me? If you could ask him for anything, what would you ask? I think that shows where Solomon's heart was and what he was pursuing, at least from the start. Verse 5 of 1 Kings chapter 3. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. God asked, God, God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this greatness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I'm only a little child, and I do not know how to carry, my, carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong, for who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for a long life, or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering judgment, I will do as you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never uh, excuse me, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands, 
David, your father, did. I will give you a long life. Catch that. Because Solomon's focus was on pleasing God and doing what he thought was right in the sight of God and pursuing righteousness and love as king over Israel. And that's what he asked God for. God said, okay, I'll give you a wise and discerning heart, but I'm also going to give you life, prosperity, and honor. Solomon, does this work in real life? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. The only time he faltered was when he took his focus off of God. We see this pattern time and time again. What about Mordecai? What about Esther? Hey, you folks, you're not even in Israel anymore. You're in exile. Does this work? Um, as a matter of fact, yeah, yes it does. Mordecai and Esther, in the, in the book of Esther, I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but hopefully you know the story. Uh, Mordecai and Esther. Esther was raised up to queen over Assyria. Over Babylon, Assyria, whichever one it was. Can't remember. <laughs> Babylon, I guess, by this time. Uh, Esther was raised up to queen. And she's like, should I do this? Should I not? And she's asking for uh, advice from her uncle Mordecai. And he says, who knows that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And by keeping her focus on her goal, on what she was meant to do, what she was aiming to do, she received life, prosperity, and honor. Namely, even the lives of her fellow countrymen. And Mordecai, by being a good servant to the king, in the situation he found himself in, it was a horrible situation, but he made the best of it, and he tried to serve God rather than man, and by doing a really good job of it and foiling some assassination plots on the king's life, he was raised to a position of honor as well. He wasn't seeking that honor. He wasn't seeking fame and fortune. But because he was faithful to God, God gave that to him anyway. God gave that to him anyway. Now, Hebrews chapter 11. Before you go, get to think that I'm starting to preach some kind of prosperity gospel... That's not what I'm saying. This is a proverb, not a set in stone rule. I'm just show, going to show that this proverb, this principle, of pursuing God above all else, and as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I'm showing you that it does and can work in real life, time and time again throughout Scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, verse, starting in verse 32. No, that's not right. Starting in... Oh, well, that was in the wrong way. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not sure if that worked. Starting in verse 32. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to even tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, or Jephthah, about David, or Samuel, or the prophets, who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received their dead, raised to life again. That sounds pretty good. That, that sounds like the kind of life I want for me. You know, all these blessings, all these good things that happen time and time again to people that are faithful to God. But, just to show you that it's not always earthly material Blessings. It's not always earthly prosperity. It's not always earthly honor that we're seeking, at, that we're guaranteed, that we're promised. He goes on to say, There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. And they were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders us and sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. 
For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What are you pursuing? More specifically, who are you pursuing? Who are you pursuing? Righteousness and love. Pursue righteousness and love. Righteousness and love are not things, like I already said. Righteousness and love is a person. The person of Jesus Christ. Pursue Christ above all else. Pursue Christ. Whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. Here's the key. Seek the giver of the gifts, for the giver is the gift. The giver himself is the gift. Christ is gift enough. Christ is our life. He is our righteousness. He is our honor. Above all, He is righteousness and love. Pursue Him. Don't pursue things. Pursue Jesus. Don't pursue happiness. Pursue Jesus. Don't pursue the American dream. Pursue Jesus. What are you pursuing? And if the church could show the world what it looks like when we pursue a person instead of things, I think we'll see a turnaround. I think this holiday called Thanksgiving will get a lot more meaningful to a lot more people. I want to finish with this quote um, from the movie Pursuit of Happiness. He says, Wealth can also be the attitude of gratitude with which we remind ourselves every day to count our blessings. That's what it means to really be prosperous, to really be wealthy, to really be rich, to count our blessings, the attitude of thankfulness, the attitude of gratitude. So what are you pursuing? Or who are you pursuing? Pursue Jesus. Because whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor, not the other way around.